they called to worship. The Bible was full of stories. You know, stories. There are stories that teach us about grace. And provide us examples for how to live. The Bible also has stories. And you know, scratch in our heads. The Bible has stories. And we like to bury it anymore. Let us use our shovels not to bury the stories. But to be into the stories. May our worship be an exploration. Thanks be to God. Now, if you will, uh, stand and sing along the praise of the Lord, the Almighty.
and welcome to Cypress Creek Christian Church, a community that is striving to put love first in all things. It is our vision as a congregation, and our mission is to help individuals and families learn to live this love first life. We practice here in worship, in our discipleship groups, in many other settings, because we desire to live a life that resembles the life we see in Jesus Christ. If you're a visitor with us this morning, we are glad that you are a part of this time of worship. And I want to remind all of you that in your worship guides there are blue cards. Uh, we ask you to register your attendance on those blue cards, but also flip it over and let us know how we can pray for you in the coming week. There'll be an opportunity later in the service to put those in the offering baskets, unless you're thinking about joining, and then we all say keep a hold of it, and you can give it to me or to one of our elders at the close of the service. Well, I want to first just lift up a big thank you. Last week was just a marvelous uh, Sunday with the cookout and everything. We had a team of folks all morning that were cooking out hamburgers and hot dogs out there in the heat uh, and helped to make a real wonderful celebration for this congregation. I'm glad you all were able, were able to be there um, to be present. I also want to lift up that our high school youth will be leaving uh, early this afternoon on their mission trip to uh, Louisiana. Please be prayerful for our youth and for their adult sponsors that are going to be going with them. They will be gone uh, for a full week. And then looking ahead to the fall, and I just want to lift this up, uh, we're going to be offering the Financial Peace University program as a Dave Ramsey program. Um, and I think it's one of those programs that would probably help all of us. There's probably something we can learn about our own spending habits that could be improved in some way or another. But we're going to offer this starting in September, and uh, you're going to hear more about it, but be thinking about maybe there's someone in your family that would be blessed by this experience. It's to help folks look at their debt, their spending, and how can I bring that in mind? so that it really works for me, so that I can be a good steward of all the resources that I have. Again, you're going to be hearing more about that in the next couple of months. And then finally, I want to lift up another thank you to, to two people who are not in this service, but will be at our later service, Tim and Stephanie Hickman. When we had the flood, right after the flood, they showed up with their RV, and it sat parked out here for, well, until just a few weeks ago when we opened up the youth building. It was the place where our youth groups met uh, on Sunday morning and at other times, and I just really appreciate their willingness to bring their RV and allow us to use it for about seven months, and that was a real gift to us as a congregation. And then, uh, two other little notes here. I want to say hi to Brad Stagg. Brad is here in worship with us. Brad is a Timothy of this congregation. <laughs> serving a church in Missouri, uh, but is currently on sabbatical. And in town, visiting family, and decided to join us for worship. So it is good to have Brad in worship with us. And then, if you have not been watching the news this morning, I just want to lift up the fact that, um, as of right now, and I'm just flipping to the news here in front of me, four of the boys have been rescued, and they're working right now. And if you're like me, it's one of those news stories that I have to keep on checking every hour of the day. <coughs> just pretty amazing stuff. Well, today we begin a new worship series, stories that we'd like to bury, stories that are confusing, stories that make us feel a little uncomfortable, stories that are strange, and even stories that portray God in a disturbing way. We too often have buried these stories, or worse, we have buried our brains so that we do not need to acknowledge the tension, the discord, the dissonance that is felt within. 
Today, though, we do take out our shovels and begin digging. Not to bury anything, but to uncover what has been hidden. To unearth, to unearth and to do a little excavating for the purpose of discovery. Today, we do so digging between the story of Noah's birth and the story of the great flood, digging around in these few verses that for many have gone unnoticed or they've been noticed without any sort of intellectual exploration. Listen to these words from Genesis 6, the opening verses. When the number of people started to increase throughout the fertile land, daughters were born to them. The divine beings, it could also be translated as sons of gods, plural. When the divine beings saw how beautiful these human women were, they took and married the ones they chose. The Lord said, My breath will not remain in humans forever, because they are flesh. They will live 120 years. In those days, giants lived on the earth, and also afterwards. When divine beings and human daughters had sexual relations and gave birth to children, these were the ancient heroes, famous men. Here ends the reading of a text that too many have buried. You join me in prayer. Where a passage of scripture might leave us scratching our heads, we turn to your spirit of wisdom for some insight, O oh, gracious God. Journey with us as we explore as we ask questions, as we dig deeply. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Many years ago, when I was serving church in Kansas City, I was in charge of getting Sunday school teachers for the youth and children's Sunday school classes. The junior high class was a challenge. And I've been on the lookout for a new teacher for that class. I found one, and on his first Sunday, as he stood before these junior high kids, he made a declaration about the Bible, one that probably many people have made, and people have just kind of heard it without any sort of thought. But this class was a unique class. It had, as a part of the class, what we called the twins. <laughs> Brothers that were incredibly intelligent, but very ornery. <laughs> they knew the Bible probably better than their teacher did. And they began pelting him with questions based upon this broad declaration he had made. They threw out all these scriptures at him. They wanted to know answers. I learned of this on Monday morning when I also learned that I needed to reopen my book for a Sunday school, a Sunday school teacher. This Bible stuff is challenging. If we are willing to allow ourselves to be engaged beyond some sort of quick surface reading. And this passage that I just read from Genesis sits amidst other stories like a turtle at the Westminster Dog Show. It just doesn't quite fit. This passage speaks of divine beings, or sons of gods, plural there. And these divine beings have taken notice of some of the humans on the earth specifically taking note how beautiful some of the women are. And they take them as their wives. And then there's a reference to giants roaming the earth, not just then, but still now. Yes, giants, and it doesn't stop there. 
Oh no, it references how the children that came from the marriage between these divine beings and humans were the heroes. Is this the Bible? Or is this a lost Tolkien's book? In the next verse, I expect Golem to make an appearance and speak about Schmeagol helping to find his precious. We need to just say it out loud. This is weird. But weird should not be the impetus to grab a shovel and start digging. Well, maybe it should, but to dig in a different way. Weird should catch our attention. Weird should entice our curiosity. Weird should engage our spiritual inquisitiveness. Amen? Yet too often we do go for the shovel to try to bury the passage or bury our brains so that we don't have to engage the passage. Now scholars, folks that are much smarter than I am, point first to how these few verses at the beginning of Genesis 6 are some of the most challenging to translate anywhere in Genesis. There are just words and phrases that we find difficult to translate from the ancient Hebrew. But these same scholars point out how these few verses sound and look a lot like some of the myths of other ancient cultures. It feels that way, doesn't it? And if that's the case, then why is it here? Well, I would suggest it's here not by accident. Now, many of you will know the name Max Licato, pastor and San Antonio author of many books, including a children's book entitled You Are Special. It is a marvelous children's book. It begins this way. The Wemmicks were small wooden people. All of the wooden people were carved by the woodmaker named Eli. His workshop sat on a hill overlooking their village. Each Wemmick was different. Some had big noses, others had large eyes. Some were tall and others were short. Some wore hats, others wore coats. But all were made by the same carver and all lived in the village. It's a fun delightful book, but it begins to move to a place where, where there's tension because there's exclusion. There's judgment. One of the women is marginalized. But like any good children's book, it ends in a very beautiful way where Eli, the word carver, the creator, affirms everyone. Well, that story, that story has been used by Sunday school teachers. That story has been used in sermons by many preachers. Well, let's just say a thousand years from now, someone comes across a segment of one of those sermons that used that book. And the part that is saved is the part that says the Wemmicks were small wooden people. Well, someone who finds that little segment say to themselves, were there once wooden people that roamed the earth? Is that really the way it was? No, a story was pulled out of one context and put into another context to make a point. Genesis has many underlying themes and narratives, but one of those is this idea that God has put forth structure and patterns a specific framework to all of creation, while human beings seem to push back. They want to counter what God is doing. They even at times undermine what God is doing. And then inserted into this larger narrative is this story, probably one that came from another culture, one that was known by the people, and what it seems to indicate is it's not just human beings that are pushing back, but it appears that the problem goes much deeper. The very structure found in the heavenly places seems to be crumbling. Can you understand why, maybe? 
that story might have been used? Flannery O'Connor, the novelist, once said, when people are unable to see, you often have to use very large and strange caricatures. I remember it was probably the late 70s, maybe the early 80s, and I heard a group of folks mention about a young girl they had seen at the restaurant. And what they said about this young girl was, I think her head spun around and, and it appeared as if she spewed forth what looked like pea soup. What? Did that little girl's head spin around and did she spit out what looked like pea soup? No, they were making a cultural reference to a movie that had come out maybe five, seven years earlier, The Exorcist, where this girl was possessed by a demon and her head spun around and she spewed out of her mouth this green-like substance. It was used to make a point that the kid's behavior in the restaurant was frightening, scary. And the use of this story in Genesis, this story from another culture, was used to make a point. Yet there are some who have read this passage and have then spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to send out search teams, literally, to go look for the bones of the giants. And there's one Christian museum that claims to have one of those bones. And then they had to backpedal a little bit and said, well, no, it's a replica of one of the bones. And then they had to backpedal a little bit more and said, well, it's an artist's reproduction based upon a description that was found in an ancient letter. And then they had to backpedal after they released the letter because it really wasn't even a very good rendition of what was described in the letter. Others have read that passage and created these complex diagrams how these giants are the children of Cain, and how there's a fallen angel, and books have been written to help describe this. And to be honest, it makes no sense to me whatsoever. And then there are those who just say it's aliens. <laughs> this geeky guy kind of likes that answer, but not in this case. Not in this case. I'm reminded of the young woman that I heard at a conference I went to, she got up during the Q&A question, and she said, I am so compelled by the Jesus story. But so many Christians spend all their time in the weeds of nonsense. I love that language. In the weeds of nonsense, where no one is following Jesus. How did the Israelites hear that story, those few verses in Genesis 6? We need to remember, this was a people who experienced slavery in Egypt. These were people who were betrayed. These were people who had been led astray by those they thought they could trust. These were people that were taken into exile, taken away from everything that made them feel comfortable and safe. The giants of fear and anxiety and despair and hopelessness were walking the earth and the people were feeling crushed by these giants. What seemed like up was suddenly down. The very thing they thought would protect them was turned against them. The trusted framework no longer seemed trustworthy. But as you continue to read the story, no matter how bleak it might have appeared, no matter how powerful the giants might have seemed, in spite of feeling as if everything was spinning out of control, read just a little further and you read how God remains God. When you're feeling crushed by the giants, when you feel as if everything is crumbling around you, when it appears that even your heavenly advocates have forgotten their place and turned against you, the story of our faith is that God remains God. Years ago, uh, Kara and her husband started attending the church that I was serving, a young couple. They'd only been attending a few weeks when I got a phone call. Kara had come home from work, 
and found her husband dead. A brain aneurysm. It was devastating, of course. A few days after his death, I'm sitting in Kara's living room with Kara and her mother and a friend of hers to talk about the funeral. Lots and lots of tears. <coughs> but then in the midst of it, Kara said something that has always stuck with me. She said, but God hasn't stopped writing my story. And then she paused for a long time and we just sat there in silence and she said, God is still writing my story. In that moment, if someone had asked Kara if there were giants walking on the face of the earth, if it felt as if the framework and structure around her appeared to be collapsing, if everything she thought was trustworthy now seemed as if you could not trust it, I bet you she would have said yes. That's the way it feels. And I'm guessing that among this congregation this morning, that if I were to ask you, if you feel as if times you are walking in a land where there are giants that cause fear and anxiety and despair and hopelessness, if I was to ask you, if there are days when what was up yesterday is now upside down and vice versa, whether that's been brought on by unemployment or a long-term relationship falling apart, the death of a loved one, money problems, a diagnosis, or just how the world feels out of control, I'm guessing you would nod. And you might sit down and watch a movie, a sci-fi movie, a, a fanciful movie that depicts terrifying giants and everything that the characters had believed to be right and safe and comfortable appears on the screen to be falling apart. And you know it's just a movie, you know it's just fantasy, but you feel like you're watching your story. You know what it's like. I imagine that for the Israelites, borrowing this story from another culture, inserting it here, it was done with a purpose. Because when they read it, they could nod. Yeah, that describes how I feel with all the chaos, with all the problems, with all the things that are bringing in security, it feels like there are giants that are about ready to crush me. I feel as if the framework that I thought could be trusted is a framework that is falling apart. But the good part of our story is we turn the page. We go to a chapter two further down, and we discover that God <coughs> remains God. The giants, the framework falling apart, the structure, those days come. But God doesn't stop being God. Our tendency, though, with passage like this is to get into the weeds of nonsense. It's not helpful. In fact, I believe it undermines the very point of the story. You come across those words in Genesis 6, and depending on the day and your current life circumstance, you can just read it as some strange, weird passage, and you want to bury it or bury your brain so you don't have to deal with it. But then there are those days when word has come, when some event has happened, when brokenness has entered into your life experience. And you read about giants on the earth and how the very framework that you think God has set in place seems to be falling apart. And you just nod. Because it feels like your story. But the good news for us is that we turn the page. And we realize that God is not done writing our story. That God remains God. You join me in prayer. We turn to you, merciful God, because we know we can. We turn to you and look to you, especially when life feels so out of control. 
when giants appear to be stomping all around us, when our trusted advocates appear to have lost their way. In such moments, we know we can turn to you, for you remain God. Your presence, your love, your encouragement. These things help to write another chapter in our life story, a chapter that does not end in despair or brokenness or hopelessness chapter that can end with hope and promise, that can lead to joy and renewed faith. Oh, gracious God, let us be aware of those around us who feel as if they are about ready to be stomped on by giants, as if their life circumstance is simply swirling out of control, as if the things they thought they could trust are no longer trustworthy. Encourage us, empower us, O oh God, to come alongside them, to walk with them, to help remind them that God, that you, O oh God, are not done writing the story. We offer these words of prayer this morning in your most beloved name, and in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day.
The story ends with promise and hope that comes forth by the woodcarver, the creator in the story. There are so many stories. Imagine the Israelites. They're in a time of crisis, but then they gather around the Passover meal. And they, not just, they don't just tell the story, but they embody the story in the meal of a God who comes, a God who responds to the cries, a God who says that your despair and slavery is not the end of the story. There's more to come. The communion table before us started at a Passover meal, and it is a reminder to all of us that our story does not end in the midst of despair. It does not end when it feels as if there are giants stomping all around us. It does not end when it feels as if everything around us is out of control. Our God is still writing our story. And it is good to gather around the table and reenact what is our ultimate story, a story of God's redemptive love that comes into our lives. May you do more than just hear that story today. But as we come forward and share in communion, may we embody that story. May it be reinforced deep within who we are. Here at Cypress Creek Christian Church, all are welcome to participate in this meal. A meal in which we remember Jesus' last meal with his disciples. Some will say, well, it's just a symbol. And yet we are defined and shaped by the symbols that we hold up as important. For those of you seated in the main section here, you are invited shortly. You will come forward for communion. You will take a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, and partake of the elements. Those on the back row, along with those in the balcony, the communion elements will be brought to you along with the offering trays. Again, I remind you, not only bringing forward your gifts, but also those blue cards, placing those in the trays. Now let us prepare for a time at the table. <laughs>
remind us of the meaning of these elements, of Jesus' sacrifice and your unchanging and redemptive love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The table is prepared. All are welcome. Please come forward and partake.
Stories in scripture that might make us just a tad uncomfortable. Stories that we just like to disengage our brains so that we don't really have to think about. But there's quite often something there. If we're willing to pull out the shovel and do some digging into the passage and explore what is present to us. I hope that you will continue, and in your worship guides this morning, there is a little hint to where we are going next week, and maybe even an invitation to read a passage from Ezekiel to uh, uh, prepare you for next Sunday. Well, here at Cypress Creek, every Sunday, we do extend an invitation. It is an invitation to be a part of a faith community, but it's also an invitation to connect one's life to Jesus Christ. If you wish this day to respond to that invitation, you can either come forward as we are singing, or you can meet with one of our elders or pastors out in the lobby at the close. Let us now join our voices. Yeah. 